Our health correspondent Nicola Hill joins us now from London. And Nicola, this is so relatable for me because this is something that I have suffered from since I was a child. And I thought that I was alone actually in this. So I'm so glad that psychologists are finally looking into it. What more can you tell us about this condition and what triggers it? Yeah, it's interesting that you just said then, Rachel, that it began in childhood because that is normally the situation. They don't know what causes it, so they have no idea whether you're born with this or whether when you're a baby, there's certain sounds that you really don't like and they narrow down to particular ones like the clicking, the chewing, the tapping. And whether something happens in childhood to trigger it in that way. Chris was telling me, I mean, he's, his is so severe, he can't work really. He says lockdown's been a real benefit for him because he runs a support um, um, cha a charity, I think it's a full charity, for people who have misophonia. Um, and he can do that from home. His charity's called So Quiet. Um, but he says he couldn't work in an office. He had to give up that job, as we heard, working in a coffee shop when he was a, a barista. If he gets on a bus and someone's making a repetitive sound, he has to actually just get off the bus. He is in that 1% who has very severe misophonia. And in his instance, when it began in childhood, it really affected him at school because he would be so distracted by somebody perhaps clicking a pen or tapping the table that he was only concentrating, his brain would only focus on that and not on what was the, the teacher was saying. So it had a, a massive impact on him. But yes, I mean, like yourself, Rachel, there are many people who, who can't stand certain sounds, who can't, particularly to do with eating, people chewing, something like that. It's that repetition. But Professor Ward is investigating, his team at Sussex University are certainly investigating it and they want to see if there is a link with other sensory disorders and whether people who have misophonia also have other conditions in a similar way and that's why they're publicising their research and that's why they're really trying to raise awareness of it. It's really all very interesting, and I know Chris uh, uses earplugs, which I always carry earplugs around with me too, just in case. Um, and I'm, I'm fortunate that I have a supportive and patient husband who, if he knows he's going to make a lot of noise when he's eating or drinking, he'll actually get up and leave the room just so he won't irritate me. But I'm wondering, what can people with misophonia manage? How can they manage um, their response better so they don't end up, I don't know, punching someone in a grocery store, which obviously is not the right reaction? Yeah, and in fact, that is actually the extreme reaction that many people want to do. And that's something Chris has said that he's really had to control himself. And Professor Ward said the main thing that they can do for people is something called cognitive behavioural therapy, which we know about in lots of other areas, particularly people perhaps who have panic attacks, because it's working in the same way. You can't cure the condition at the moment, but what you can do is manage your reaction to it. And it's breaking that link between how your body reacts and the sound you're hearing. So Professor Ward has done extensive um, examination on some people with misophonia and has shown how parts of the brain actually light up when they hear the sounds that they hate. So that's why they know it's a physiological response. It's not something you're making up. It really is a physiological response. But they can't stop that. But what they can do, as I said, is to break the link. So it's using CBT techniques to help people like you, Rachel, deal with that. And that's the main thing, because otherwise, Chris said, you know, he's got the earplugs. He wears his Bluetooth, Bluetooth um, ear headphones or wears headphones to block sounds out or literally removes himself from situations. But you can't live like that the whole time. It's far too restrictive. So it's only by dealing with the body's reaction to the sounds that people are going to be able to deal with it in the long term. And Professor Ward is hoping that by doing this research into a condition that was only given its own title in the beginning of this century. So, I mean, you know, when Chris was a child, it didn't, the condition didn't have a proper name. They're hoping that by doing all this research, they will eventually find better ways to help people deal with misophonia and possibly find out exactly what's triggering it and prevent people from coming with it. But at the moment, they really don't know. And that's why this research is underway. Hmm. Well, but maybe there's hope on the horizon. Nicola Hill in London, thank you so much.